Hello again, everybody. This will be part two of our ancillary infectious diseases here. And actually, some of these are going to be fairly high yield. Um, it's just uh, I put them here because I didn't really have anywhere else to put them. So this is actually these three are going to be pretty high yield um, for all three steps. So I would suggest paying pretty close attention here. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the I button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. And certainly feel free to subscribe to my channel and you'll get updates and notifications as I put more and more videos up. We're going to talk here about some bacterial uh, diseases. And uh, you're going to see that two of these are actually toxin mediated. So we'll talk about toxic shock syndrome, Q fever, and tetanus. Toxic shock syndrome is a life-threatening toxin-mediated disease that's associated with tampon use, surgical wounds, and surgical procedures. Basically what happens here is you get an infection, and that infection is not actually causing the disease, but those bacteria that proliferate create a toxin, and then that toxin causes the disease. So there's two things that we need to do. We need to eradicate the infection, and we need to neutralize the toxin. Um, so the cause, this is usually caused by Staph aureus. However, you can have a streptococcal toxic shock syndrome, and that would be caused by strep pyogenes. Uh, obviously, the history here is going to be consistent with the risk factors. So look for someone using highly absorbent tampons, not taking them out properly, recent surgery, recent delivery. Um, particularly here, the way that the USMLE likes to throw this at you is you've got to 15-year-old girl who maybe didn't get the best sex ed, she's using tampons, she didn't know, she's got to take them out, and now she's coming in, she's septic, she's febrile, she's looking really sick, um, and then, you know, they might tell you you do a vaginal exam and out comes this nasty-smelling tampon. That's usually how they will give it to you. It's, they're going to be pretty straightforward. Uh, the symptoms are going to be pain at the source site. Uh, they can have fever, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, very nonspecific. But the giveaway here is this desquamative rash, and it tends to be on the hands and feet. The diagnosis here is clinical. This is emergency, so we don't wait for labs. The treatment is resuscitation, which you're going to do even before you even try to make this diagnosis. You've got a patient coming in who's hypotensive, fluids and pressors. Got to get that blood pressure up. They got to perfuse their brain, otherwise they're going to die. So resuscitation, and then once you suspect toxic shock syndrome, do not wait. Clindamycin and vancomycin. Now, why do we use clindamycin and vancomycin? Because clindamycin stops toxin formation. Remember clindamycin? What, how does it work? Blocks the ribosome. What does the ribosome do? Makes proteins, including toxins. Vancomycin kills the infection. So we need to do both. This is the disquamative rash. This is a giveaway here. Q fever is a chronic illness, usually, that manifests in a variety of different ways. Uh, however, what's going to come up on your exam is that they'll tell you you're dealing with a veterinarian or a farmer who's around animals all the time, particularly when the animals are giving birth, because this tends to be carried in placenta. Uh, so look for a history of occupational exposure, either a veterinarian or a farmer. Uh, the symptoms are pretty nonspecific, flu-like symptoms, hepatomegaly, splenomegaly. Uh, again, they're going to be pretty straightforward with you on giving you the hints here. Diagnosis, uh, look for... Uh, I mean, because this is rare, you're often not going to carry this at the top of your differential. But if you've got a patient who's got nonspecific symptoms, maybe some disturbed liver functions, hepatomegaly, uh, you should get a serology for coxiella. Uh, and then the treatment here is doxycycline. I always tell this to my students. If you get something from animals or from ticks and you're taking, a, you're taking your exam, Go with doxycycline. Uh, that's a good one for the zoonoses and the tick-borne illnesses because it just more often than not is the right answer. Is it always the right answer? No. Am I telling you to take this pearl into the clinic with you? No. But on your exam, if you if you don't know what antibiotic to give and it came from an animal, 
go with doxycycline. Okay, so tetanus is also toxin mediated, and we all know how this happens. You step on a rusty nail, or you get sliced and it gets contaminated with dirt, maybe in a car accident. Uh, this develops over a week. It is very preventable, and it's preventable because we give vaccines. The cause is Clostridium tetany. The symptoms of tetanus itself is going to be myospasm, irritability, stiffness, muscle pain, um, and then eventually their muscles lock up. And the cause of death is usually respiratory arrest. Remember, if you've got a patient with these signs, you've got to look for the wound. Diagnosis here is completely clinical, and the treatment is going to be supportive at first. Make sure that you're ready to intubate them. If they're, you want to make sure that you're monitoring them. If they go into respiratory distress, they're going to be intubated and sent to the ICU. Um, then as far as treatment, it's going to be tetanus immunoglobulin to, uh, to block the toxin, metronidazole to kill the bacteria, and then benzodiazepines and surgical debridement. Um, the benzodiazepines is to help with the symptoms, and the surgical debridement is to, to, to clean the wound. And then, of course, these patients should then be vaccinated. Everybody should get the vaccine every 10 years for prophylaxis. That's a universal recommendation. Now, what about a tetanus-prone wound? That is a wound that could theoretically cause tetanus, but the patient doesn't currently have any symptoms. So, you know, you got someone coming in after a car accident, they slice their arm on the metal, and now it's all full of dirt. Um, so there's nothing you can really do at this point to prevent the infection, but what you can do is you can prevent the, the, the disease. So what we're going to do here is, yes, we're going to decontaminate the wound and everything, uh, but then we need to start thinking about preventing tetanus, the disease. So what we do is we, we review the vaccination history. If they've been immunized in the last five years, you don't need to do anything. If they were immunized five to ten years ago, the question is how effective is that vaccine still going to be? So we're going to give the vaccine again. If they're not immunized or if it's unknown, you're going to give both the vaccine and tetanus immune globulin. And then this is just a review of everything we talked about.